está aqui eh, nos eh, nossos eh, bons amigos, em Portugal, o Alcê, o Fernando, o Fichão e o Cavani. Eh, eu creio que o seu mensagem é extraordinariamente interessante e que se ajuda a tratar os outros altos pontos de vista eh, que o Fernando está exposando nesta mesma sala eh, em torno dos temas do eh, mundo islâmico e do pensamento islâmico e da sua relação com as outras comunidades. Partiria que é esta via de diálogo, de reflexão, o que é importante para construir aquelas comunidades que preveiam como fundamentais do processo de Barcelona, que é o projeto fundamental da atividade desta casa, que é o que vocês sabem, para construir a Mediterrânea, da pau e da estabilidade, da progresso económico compartido e, muito especialmente, da diálogo eh, entre os povos e culturas ao voltante da Mediterrânea. Mas, por isso, por tanto, já nos plau no momento eh, e, para a banda leda, donar-se a bem-vinda a todos vocês. E, sem ser mais, por tanto, lhe passo a palavra ao Sr. Agustí Colomines, o diretor do Inés Cucat, para que ele faça a apresentação do nosso diferencial. Bom, bom, boa tarde a todos. Muito obrigado ao Sr. Seu Forense, diretor do Instituto Europeu da Mediterrânea, pelo fato de acolher-nos nesta casa, que sempre é um fato muito importante. Mas, especialmente hoje, em esta conferência do Tchek Mohamed Isam Kavani, que para nós, desde a Unesco, é um prazer ter um de acolher esta conferência. Uh, Tendrei o atrevimento de apresentá-lo, malgrado que uh, uh, seguramente não correspondia para a quantidade de, 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 de honores que tem o mateix Cheik. Uh, només desde um ponto de vista personal, eu diria dizer que ele é uh, químico, uh, para a Universidade, para a prestigiosa Universidade Americana de Beirut, do Líban. Por um mateix temps, é feito uh, estudos de medicina a Lovaina, a Bélgica, e é, está, uh, também tem o grau em uh, Dret uh, Islâmico, para a Universidade de Damasco, uh, a Síria. No? Uh, desde o ponto de vista de las suas uh, posições na atualidade, é a dizer, dos seus cargos, hoje em dia é o presidente do Conselho de, de Líderes Islâmicos e, ao mesmo tempo, é o presidente do, 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 do Conselho Supremo Islâmico de, de América. Mas, creio que o mais importante, para a que estes honores, é a filosofia que há a rede do Cheik e do que ele eh, propõe, porque isso sim que diga muito claramente amb os objetivos que, que se planteiam ao mesmo, no? que são eh, basicamente, eh, ele representa o honor de Sufi, da Lisboa Mística, que trabalha, para dizer assim, pela via do cor, pela via do amor eh, a Deus, e, eh, em aquele sentido, o el, el, el sufismo, que pode ser sufi ou xiita, mas também há alguns eh, sufis que defensam a ideia que Uh, uh, no cal que és assim musulmano, digamos assim, para aproximar-se a esta uh, obra. No? Uh, aquilo que é mais importante, a banda da de, de antiguidade que tem a obra, no? que se vai fundar em 1980, uh, é o fet digamos, de como se aproxima um a la, a la ordre, o sufi, e que é o que aporta? Basicamente, um caminho de pau. Essencialmente, aporta um caminho de, de pau, justamente porque um dos slogans que tem el, el, el sufismo, e que é tret na página web deles, é que o sufismo, eh, eh, para a pau, o amor é a clau que abre todas as portas. Não? És, eh, Basicamente, 
aquesta idea de pau, que és la que connecta directament amb la UNESCO, és aquest camí cap a la comprensió de l'altre que també uneix en aquest sentit els objectius de la UNESCO i és al mateix temps la idea de diàleg entre les diferents tradicions, cosa que evidentment això des de l'Associació UNESCO per al diàleg interreligiós hem fet a bastament. Per tant, en aquest sentit són contraris i és contrari a tota interpretació fonamentalista i extremista de l'Islam. I això creiem que des de l'Unesco Cert creiem i suposo que també des de l'Institut Europeu de la Mediterrània segur que estem en la mateixa línia. Això és fonamental avui dia en un món que és prou conflictiu. En un món que és en el qual les agressions entre els uns i els altres estan a l'ordre del dia. Per tant, presentar aquí a Barcelona una conferència com la que ens donarà en aquests moments, que és una perspectiva islàmica de construcció de societats plurals a partir de la seva ordre, Sofí, a mi sembla que és un aspecte important i en aquest sentit crec que ens hem d'alegrar que les visions que sempre es volen donar de l'Islam són pràcticament sempre negatives i que aquesta tarda, aquest vespre ja, que puguem tenir una interpretació tolerant i bondadosa del que és una creença religiosa. I moltíssimes gràcies per estar aquí. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. It's an honor and pleasure that uh, I am here in this institute today, European Institute of the Mediterranean. And I would like to thank the Mr. Director and from the uh, to make that possible. Before I begin, I would like to say that I traveled most of the world. I am a frequent flyer. I have accumulated more than 10 million miles. So in every mile must be I met someone. So, what I can see is that Islam said 1400 years ago, according to the revelation to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, La ikraha fitin. There is no compulsory in religion. You cannot force anyone to believe what you believe. But you can be together to live in a harmonious way. I don't want to say that the Muslims are innocent from bringing a negative vision of Islam, but some Muslims, unfortunately, they did blend Islam to be a negative religion. And we are very sorry for that, and it is very painful in our hearts. God has said, as Prophet mentioned, يُحْشَرُ الْمَرْءُ مَعْمَنْ أَحَبْ means people will come together with whom they love. Means whom you love are the one that you'll be among them. And what Rumi said, and I think this year is the UNESCO year for Rumi. They are celebrating Rumi's uh, uh, 1000 year, I think, and it is this year. So he said, 
and I think every one of, of you might know or might heard about the great saint, great Sufi saint, uh, Jalal al-Din al-Rumi, who is buried in uh, Konya, in Turkey. He said, I don't know myself. If I, if I am a Christian, or a Jew, or a Zoroastrian, or a Muslim, I feel myself, I'm all of them. I can be with them all in the same time, with the same heart, and there is no difference. Because Islam, and I say Islam, not Muslims, there is big difference between Islam and Muslims. Islam says, that human beings are equal, like the teeth of the comb are equal, people are equal. There is no differences between anyone except, except in only one difference, how much that person is pious and sincere. So we see from here that Islam extended its hand to all the communities that they were living in, the, in, the, in that time with Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. In his city, which is called today al Madinah al munawwara the holy city, the enlightened city, they were living Jews. They were living Christians. They were living all kinds of different religions. And all of them, they were living in harmony. They didn't fight with each other. They built bridges with each other. And the example of that, which will come later to our topic, the example of that is when Prophet was being tortured, Prophet Muhammad, was being tortured with his friends, with his companion. When he delivered the, the first years of delivering the message of Islam, he was tortured by his tribe, his own people, his, his own blood, his own family. What he did? He didn't fight them. He didn't raise a sword. He was extending his hands. And this we can see it in the Islamic history of this life of Prophet. When his companion are not anymore able to take it, it was so much torture. They were putting big stones, tying the hands of his companion in the back, put them in the desert under the sun, and put big stones over their chest, torturing them. So what Prophet did? He asked, who likes to seek asylum in another country? I am giving permission. Who likes to migrate to another country? I give permission. Many of them, as today, we migrate. Many of them, they said, we like to migrate. And he sent them where? He sent them to the king of Abyssinia, who was a greatest believer in Jesus Christ. He sent them to Abyssinia, west. West of what it is known today, Saudi Arabia, it is west of that. They went there, and the king of Abyssinia opened his arms and welcomed them. And he told them, tell me about your religion. And they mentioned him the, one of the important chapters in Holy Quran about Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And he looked at them. And he said, 
there is no difference between you and us. Live in this country happily. I'm giving you asylum and I'm giving you support in my country. That is a Christian king welcoming Muslims that has been tortured. And today, we see Muslims are seeking asylum. Where? Look, Prophet prediction from 1400 years ago, he was telling them to move west means in the West, you will find heart, good-hearted people. It is an indication that there is going to be in the West very nice-hearted people. They, they, they love people. They love tolerance. They love everyone to come to their countries. And they are hospitable. And that's why you see today, Muslims, they migrate to the West and to Spain, it is in the west from the most of the Arab countries, not uh, some of uh, Spain and Europe and France and Germany and England and America, all of them, they are west. And we see that they open their heart to us. What is our duty as Muslims to do? Is to be thankful not to be hateful. We have to look forward to give the best example that we can show to those people who hosted us. You never see someone migrate to China. You never see anyone migrate to Pakistan. You don't see anyone migrate to Afghanistan. You don't see anyone migrate east. Because Prophet mentioned West. So it is the West that is going to give asylum to people with a good heart. And we thank the Spanish government and the European government and America that hosted this tremendous amount of Muslims from around the world that they came and established themselves in these countries. Our duty is to be grateful, to accept and to work and integrate in the community as, if we are in Spain, as Spanish. Culture has to integrate with each other, to learn from each other. If we don't learn from each other, we will be ignorant. Islam says, Seek knowledge, even if it is far away in China. Means learn the culture of people, learn their languages, in order to achieve what you need. And Islamic spirituality, which we call it today Sufism, it's a way of life, because it has a universal language. We speak different language, but Sufism or spirituality, they have one universal language, is the language of the heart. The language of the heart doesn't need translation. Language of the heart is the good manners, the moral values, the values that you show to people, the discipline, the love, the tolerance. People, they say, we have to tolerate each other. Sufism says, no, it's not enough. It's not only tolerate. You have to tolerate and to accept. Tolerate is easy. You can tolerate each other. It's easy. OK, I accept you. You accept me. Uh, I, I, I tolerate your ideas. You tolerate my ideas. No, accept their ideas and they accept your ideas. That's how we integrate. How, this is how we can live a civilized country. So we saw there is a big problem around the world. 
And we tried as a human being, as individuals, to work, although to work hard, to meet with different head of states in order to give some advice for a better life. Although we received a lot of death threat, but we didn't stop. We continue our work. So where is our work begin? Our work begin in the grassroots. We are not politicians that we want to sit uh, in uh, to to sit on chairs in uh, to 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 look after the affair of a country. We, we are not politicians. We are religious people. So we seek only how to be good in a community and how to build ourselves and our children and our communities to be good individuals. So the best way we found, and and the topic they mentioned Naqshbandi. Naqshbandi means, I was explaining before, it's like we say we, I am graduated from Harvard or I am graduated from Stanford or I am graduated from Sorbonne. Naqshbandi is like you are graduated from that school or university at that time in Central Asia, which was the fountain of knowledge, of spreading knowledge. And in Bukhara, in Central Asia, we can find at that time uh, uh, different religions living together. You find, till today, if you go to Uzbekistan, where, in Samarkand and Bukhara, where this Naqshbandi Sufi way originated, uh, it's not originated because the man who established that university, it's called after his name, but it's originated from the Prophet, peace be upon him. But there, were, there were a multiculture there that they were integrating with each other. Like today, I was hearing in Madrid when I was meeting with uh, some officials, especially Secretary of State, he said to me that they are, they are having a alliance of cultures, civilizations. of civilizations. And it is it's very good idea, and it's a corridor to all civilization to come together, especially these three main religions to come together and sit together. So in Central Asia, uh, when uh, that big saint, uh, if we call him saint or scholar, or you call him here maestro or professor, uh, I'm learning some Spanish words. So he established in every small village. He established center, community centers, which we call in Arabic, ribat. We call in, uh, in subcontinent language, khanikas. We call in Turkish language, darga. So they established small, small, like today they have these host hostels, where they have people come and stay, and learn and educate themselves, eat and drink, find a, a, a way to live together, understand from each other. So when he saw that Central Asia was a alliance of civilization at that time, or multicultural uh, uh, understanding between different cultures and different religions, because we can see it till today there is the huge uh, uh, big uh, wall of the Jew, Jewish uh, wall is still there in S Samarkand. You can see the Christian uh, churches, you can see the monasteries, the Buddhist, you can see the Zoroastrian, you can see the Hindus, they have different places and now they are renovating it. So he tried to bring all of them to integrate with each other and by this way, they can live in peace. And this is really what happened. So he was able to bring all these together by establishing in every place a small, a small hostel that people can meet and sit and learn and send one representative in every place. So we have that framework 
And we begin to think that if we want to do that, we can save a lot of people from being radicalized. Radicalized by different influences from different places. So what we did, we founded in every place a small center that can host people and teach them in seminars and workshop. We teach them how to love each other and integrate with each other. And in our centers, you can around the world, you can see different religion. It's not only the Muslims has to be there. No. Anyone can be there and sit and learn about how to be a good citizen in the country that he is living in. More on top of that, we saw a lot of people who were addicted to drugs. We pulled them out of the streets and we taught them how to clean themselves from drugs. And that way, we begin to find that it's so effective that by time, slowly, slowly, we were able to neutralize in themselves that radicalization that they have established or learned from these violent people who unfortunately some of them are Muslims. So in this situation we were able to change many grassroots people in different countries. And I give you an example in one of the biggest countries, which is a Muslim country, Indonesia. Every year I travel there, I meet with head of state, and we meet with people there every day, every day. We, we, we give lectures uh, to, in every lecture there will be 7,000 people, 10,000 people, uh, uh, sometimes 150,000 people. Sometimes they close all the roads. You cannot move anywhere. You have 30,000 people on the roads. It's allowed by the government. This is how Indonesia big. So I was giving lectures every day in the morning and in the evening. And I saw a group of people. One day, they look strange. They dress in a strange way. It might be you think I am dressed strange way for you. <laughs> But they were strange to me. But since I know different cultures, so I knew from where is their background. The, those who were sitting in every day with me, they didn't like them to come because they know them, they are from the country. And they know their background. They want to kick them out. I said, no, wait, leave them in. So there were around 10 people. I spoke to them and I, I gave the lecture, they heard it, and after they, they left. They came next day, they heard, they left. Third day, fourth day, five days, seven days, at the end they say to me, we want to be your student. We like what you are saying. We. We never heard something like that because we speak about spirituality and the advancement, how to, how to uh, uh, ascend from our bad desires to heavenly desires and heavenly uh, power in order to establish the uh, spirituality in ourselves to eliminate what is bad and keep what is good. So it's a technical uh, uh, seminars and workshop that we do on uh, speak with people. It's not a way to explain it here now, but it's a way of building back the people to uh, and uh, take them out of what they have been radical radicalized with. So they said we want to follow you. I said okay. 
They said, can you visit our mosque? I said, yeah, I can. They said, we are 10,000 people. This is in your country. I said, no problem. So the people who were around me, they said, don't go. It might be dangerous. So I didn't go. I was worried. Next day they came, the following day, they said they didn't come. I said, I didn't come because I felt uh, threatened. They said, no, we like what you speak and I, we want you to address our people to change them, <coughs> to make them like us. I said, okay. They said, but we want to ask you one thing. Now after we became your student, can you tell us where we can go for jihad? I look at them. I said, I spent with you 10 days talking to you about there is no concept of jihad anymore. The concept of jihad has a lot of principles. There is 14 different kinds of jihad. 13 of them are the jihad against the self. And one of them a jihad if there is an aggression against you, then you have to defend yourself. But you cannot go and fight for no reason. That is a terrorism, it's not jihad anymore. They said, oh, then there is no concept of jihad, so we don't go for fighting. I said, no, of course you don't go to far fighting. You won't go for jihad, there is a way for jihad for you. Go and make jihad of love to people. Teach people what you have learned here. They look at each other and they said, thank you, we were misled. At that time, I went to their mosques and I spoke to the people there. And slowly, slowly, they've been neutralized from being radicals and they become more spiritual. But this takes time. This takes a lot of work in order to uh, work in, in different places. And uh, I think that the main issue is how to find the right scholars. How to find where you can, which one, which scholar is the scholar that is a moderate. We have this problem. As Westerners, it's very difficult for a Westerner who is not a Muslim to identify a moderate scholar. You can say, oh, that one is very, very moderate. He speaks very well. But you don't know what he is hiding behind him. That is the problem. The problem is you see someone moderate but look what is behind him. What, what he is bringing behind, as soon as he gets very controlling and strong, he begins to bring his own ideas that he was hiding. So this is what we are facing today in different, of, different countries. And that is an issue, how to identify a moderate scholar where to go to identify a moderate scholar. I was in a country that it is near you. I will not mention which country. It's in the, in the Mediterranean. And I asked them, I was meeting with one of these big officials. I asked him, how is, uh, I see that your country is uh, suffering from these radicals. He said, yes, we are suffering a lot. It's not a Western country, it's an Arab country. He said to me, unfortunately, we went to Arab Peninsula where this exportation of, uh, they export to us all these uh, radicals. We went to them and government are tracking them down now. Different countries in Arab world, they are tracking them down. 
So we went and said to this country, you, you were the cause to bring all these radicals. There was no, radi no radical uh, uh, extreme in Islam. I Islam was always very moderate, very peaceful, very loving, very tolerant. Who, who, who protected the Jews that they came from Spain all the way to, to Turkey? Is not the emperor of Turkey, Sultan Abdul Hamid? He's a Muslim, Muslim emperor. He gave them shelter in, in Turkey. So Islam protected everyone. I don't understand what's going on today, but we see that it is more coming, coming now, not, a religious, uh, not as a religious background, is more a, a globalization of hate. It's more misunderstanding and rebel, rebellious, re, rebelling against governments and against the West. Because they see that there is a problem, a political problem in the Middle East and cannot be solved. So these uh, radicals or these, if we call them terrorists or radical or whatever, or violent uh, mentality, try to play on the emotion of people to hate the West. And that's what we are seeing today. Like the, what they did with the cartoon. We are not going to open that subject, but this is how they used it in order to instigate hate against the West. And they forgot how much they destroyed the relics of the Prophet, and they didn't leave any, any, any relic, any of the relics of the Prophet, and no one said anything. When it came to cartoon, everyone stood up. We sent a lot of letters to UNESCO. Please stop the destruction of uh, the relics of the Prophet in uh, Mecca and Medina, the ho two holy cities. No one, no, one, no one said anything except one newspaper in uh, New York and one newspaper in England. In any case, so <coughs> the problem is that uh, he said to me, that very high official uh, person, he said to me, you went to this country, Arab country, which they send export uh, uh, these uh, radicals. He told them, you have to stop that. They said, we stopped it. But it went too far, beyond our hands. We cannot control it anymore. They cannot control. It's impossible to control. From a cave, we don't know from where in Afghanistan, these radicals are moving, and they have all these uh, long hands around the different world, different part of the countries. So, our methods is to work with the grassroots, uh, not to work with uh, uh, mosques, because we cannot identify which mosque is what. But for, for. We, as scholar, we can, but for normal people, you cannot identify which mosque is what. So we prefer to do a small community centers, and this is what we proposed. I was in England. I proposed that to some officials there, that to establish community centers and call it that youth, youth at risk, and especially from the Muslim community, bring them in, give them some sports, Give them, let them integrate with some other non-Muslims in these community centers, and let them work together. By this way, they will build up back their the way they are thinking, and they look more toward uh, uh, what needs to be done. And I think they will become better uh, uh, people in the community. We did that since 1974, before the problem of 9-11, because we saw that there is a problem uh, in, the, in the West. And this uh, group of people be, are increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing. Unfortunately, at that time, governments were not opening their eyes. They let with their 
open mind and open hearts and their love to immigrants, they opened their countries <coughs> and immigrants came in, unfortunately, this is what happened. Now how to solve the problem? We have to go slowly, as it was for 50, 60 years, since 1960 it came to America, I don't know since when it came to Europe, this uh, radical uh, movement, but we know from in, 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 in America it came since 1960 with the first students immigrant. <coughs> they had a lot of uh, oil money and they began to establish centers there in order to, to implement uh, their ideas. And uh, now uh, it's becoming strong and it is very difficult to break through. The only way to break through is to go to the grassroots and teach them what they have to learn. In America, there is, there is a separation between state and religion. It's very difficult to work without uh, backing from the government. In UK, I'm, I, I see and I, 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 I'm uh, seeing that there is support from the government. And they are working with many different groups in order to bring these community centers alive and to bring these uh, uh, communications with each other and to integrate the Muslims with the, other, with the others in different communities. And by this way, we are neutralizing the problem. I don't know in Spain how far can go, but we have already some centers in Madrid and in uh, Barcelona and in uh, 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 Granada and they are working on the grassroots and some of the people I think they are here uh, listening uh, to and they were before lost and they found the truth. Uh, I can show them to you by ask them to stand up all of those who are followers of Maulana Sheikh Nazim can stand up. So, I think half of the people. Please, thank you very much. And they are very professional. They are uh, educated people and they are working hard to go and speak with other youth at risk in order to bring them and hug them and bring them in showing them love and helping them in their lives and I think by this way you can change and most most of them we don't say this is a Muslim or this is a Christian or is it this Jew or no no you can go to to someone house of them, and you can see the Virgin Mary's picture, Jesus' picture, and on the other side, Holy Quran uh, calligraphy, and uh, and you can see on the other side there is a prayer rug. They are they are integrated with each other, and we don't say anything, and they are uh, like that. So, I think this is, uh, I, in short, uh, that what. In Akshbendi way can do, and this is one of the topic. I think that, uh, this is what we have, we are doing, and we hope that uh, this works. And other other group also, or other maestro, other teacher, other masters will will take that an example and follow in the same way. As in Spain, we have in France. As in France, we have in Belgium. We have in Germany, in Italy, Switzerland, America, England. Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Southeast, uh, South America, Argentina, Brazil, Chile. So, in Turkey, Middle East, we have everywhere. So, I hope that w we can have we can have a change. Uh, they say that it's not the quantity of people is the quality, because the quality is what we look for. The quality can bring the quantity. So as much as we have good qualities, as much as we can bring more quantities. And may God forgive us, and may God bless you.
And thank you very much. If, if, if uh, there is a question, or yeah. Efectivamente, si hay alguna, alguna pregunta. You see, they are satisfied, they have no questions. <laughs> Un momentet que li passaran el micròfon perquè et pugui fer la traducció, perquè si no ell no el comprendrà. I si no poguéssim, ja li faria la traducció. Aquí, aquí, aquí el senyor d'allà al mig. Es pot la traducció simultània, sap? Assalamu alaikum, senyor Sant. Assalamu alaikum, senyor Sant. I no, ho diré en català, no?, com ho hem demanat. Més que una pregunta és, diguem, cuidar en el ser, a mencionar que aquest exemple de convivència no és res nou. És nou per nosaltres. Però com a ser coneix molt bé a molts de qüestos, a paràfia que els coneix i a comunitats, i a aquesta convivència que estem, com per exemple a Singapur, a Sri Lanka, a Tailàndia, a l'est d'Àfrica, i en funció, i el seu ho coneix, i és una cosa on els musulmans estan integrats en la vida econòmica i política, i a la Xina, i vos també, i entonces, bueno, vull dir que no és una cosa estranya en el món, no? Ho és per nosaltres, però no és en el món, i ja ho sé, ho sap i que s'ha d'acordar el que es té. Gràcies. No, it's, it's not a question. It's a, he is explaining uh, a situation that, yeah, for sure, uh, Sufism from beginning, it was, uh, a, 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 it was integrating with different uh, cultures and people were living together and learning from each other. And that's why uh, uh, we see that Prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad, uh, Prophet of the Messenger of Islam, that he was always, uh, uh, when he was young, he was uh, trading between uh, uh, Medina and, uh, or Mecca and, uh, and Pal uh, uh, what we know today as Jerusalem uh, and, uh, and Damascus. And he used to meet on the way and integrate with uh, all these rabbis and the priests and the monks. And he used to speak with them and integrate with them and uh, uh, listen to them and they listen to him. And we see never there was a problem on that. So I think that uh, that is true. Uh, but today, we, because of too much, uh, uh, too much uh, wealth and desires and uh, people are only uh, uh, not feeling the problems of the others and not sharing, uh, everyone is busy with his own life. That uh, idea of integrating between small communities disappeared. And that's why you don't know your neighbor even. Who is your neighbor, who is not so... Because too much materialistic life, no, there is no more any spiritual life. And that's why you can... I, I give you an example. Many of these actors today in Hollywood, they have uh, spiritual masters today because they, they felt they have everything. They have the best life you can imagine. They're very rich, but there is a vacuum in themselves that they want to fill, uh, to fill their, their themselves with something that's spiritual. So they are following a lot of uh, uh, spiritual masters, gurus around the world. So uh, uh, people are in need for some, some, such spiritualities. And that's why I said 
a community center, if it, it will be supported by the government and people can come and st play together and sit together and eat together sometime, it will create, like universities today, universities are creating this cultural uh, different uh, alli alliance of civilization because you can see them how they integrate with each other. But we need after school, we need after university something that people can work together and live together and speak together. And uh, we hope that uh, in the future that governments will realize that and it will be uh, taken care of and people will feel that uh, they are uh, they know each other instead of not knowing any uh, your neighbor here you don't know your neighbor who is living beside you in the previous time you don't eat before you send to your neighbor food from your home in order that he can eat with you now today they don't find this this love this relationship it's it's not anymore the social life this the social life is the ties between different social social communities is lost today so we hope to bring it back, and I think that's how we can solve the big problem. centrado en el estudio de los males del mundo, de los males del alma, del ego. Eh, y quisiera saber eh, cuál es la propuesta del sufismo, cuál es la visión de usted ante uh, un problema generado por esos males de, del ego, eh, tan grande como ahora mismo es el cambio climático y la amenaza de colapso de nuestra sociedad ante este problema. Me centro en este problema, podría centrarme en otros muchos, pero concretamente me centro en este porque es uno de los que más me preocupa. Muchísimas gracias. A global warming, of course, it is a, a problem. A global the globalization can be used in order to solve problems, and globalization can be used in order to destroy people. So uh, Sufism, it's like a, a web, like a web of bees that they come together, but without a queen, they don't make honey. The bees are there. But the queen is not there to make honey. So the queen is the self, is, is the real good side of the self. And that's why if we can, the bees is our, all our organs and all our uh, different uh, desires that ask us to do things might be good, might be evil. So it is the way which you go. If the bees goes with the bad desires, they become, we call them, swamp, uh, uh, those uh, wasp. wasp, those who stink, because they are the bad bees. So we become wasps in the community and we begin to stink each other. Sufism will trick to take you to the other side where you find the good desires, where you become not uh, wasps that stinks, but you become bees that gives honey. And people can begin to taste that honey. Now, the honey is you have to taste it. But today what we do, people do, does, is they, this, they, if there is honey in this cup, they will describe to you the honey. They say, oh, it's nice honey, it's look uh, yellowish, it's goldish, it's coming from uh, the pine trees and the forest, or some honey is dark color, and they are nicer, uh, there is no, uh, they are organic, but they never give you to taste it. They're only describing it. Today they describe solution, but it stays, uh, and resolutions, but it stays in the drawers. It never comes out in appearance. It doesn't appear. 
So the importance is to give to people to taste. Sufism at the grassroots, they give people to taste. And that's why we bring back people to their nature, to their natural lives. And that's why many of them that you saw here today, some of the that students of Sufism, they, they are so much connected against the pollution of the world and against war, global warming. And they are trying to speak and stand up in order to prohibit all kind of chemicals that goes in the air and speak up. So they are doing their work, but they are minorities. There are few. You don't see the, the whole community stand up. What we need, we need whole countries. We cannot be the politicians. We are a citizen. So it is the politician uh, responsibility to stand up and to speak about global warming. It's not only the GA summit, and after they ate and they drank, they left. <laughs> well, we need to, to have things to be done. And that's where comes the work of the UNESCO, that to implement things in order to reduce poverty, AIDS, uh, uh, global warming, uh, uh, problems around the world. Uh, and UNESCO today also they cannot do because they don't have enough finance and countries are not paying their, their duties to their obligations. So it is, it is a complicated issue that it's combined all together. So Sufis cannot give, they can give an advice, but they cannot give the, they cannot implement the solution. So the solution has to be supported by politicians. And that's why I said many times, interface dialogue are so important, but if they are not supported by politicians, it's a waste of time. In an interface dialogue, I asked many times, in many different interface dialogue, that we need politicians to be sitting with us. If we take decisions, the politician has to uh, execute it, or else it will be go in the drawers. And that's, and that's the problem. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Salam. I didn't hear any translation. Yeah. You would like to hear from you any advice to become more spiritual. Ah, okay. That was the first one. Some, some, <coughs> some advice. Hmm? No, no, some advice. But to be more spiritual is the journey of the Gnostics. Gnostics are those who are looking for knowledge and they are looking for truth. Everyone try to find the truth, but the truth is where? Is the truth in what we are seeing? The problem today is we are looking always outside exterior. The truth is within you. We have to look inward. We have to look within ourselves in order to be, to learn about spirituality. When you look at yourself and you see that what you are doing is accepted, to you or not. Sometimes you do th things that you regret it. Sometimes you do things 
that is okay. So spirituality is a way of finding the truth within the self, and that's why it is said, "Man arifa nafsahu, faqad arifa rabbahu." Who knows himself will know his Lord. He knows the truth. Now, because we are far away from knowing our Creator, from our knowing our Lord, we take everything with no consideration, as if there is nothing has important and we do whatever we like in this life. Seekers, they look for reality, for truth, to, to convince themselves that they did something correct. And I'll give you an example, how spirituality works. One, one of the companions of the Prophet, and since you, are, you speak Arabic, for sure you know, Sayyidina Umar, one of the companion of the Prophet, second, uh, second uh, Khalifa of the Prophet, Caliphate. When he became a Caliphate, he came, everyone gave him that we elect you, we like you to be Caliphate. He went home and he was crying. And his wife looked at him, she said, you are the king now, you are the highest authority, why you are crying? And he said, leave me alone. Let me think of what I am doing. And she insisted to know why he's crying. He became the, the, the highest authority in, in the, in, on, on Islam after Prophet and after the first caliphate. He said, oh my wife, today I became the second caliphate. Now I feel myself responsible if someone sleep hungry, I'm responsible in front of God. If someone homeless, I'm responsible in front of God. More than that, if someone in the jungle lost his way, I'm responsible in front of God. So he began to feel that responsibility toward the people. So Sufism spirituality, when we begin to look within ourselves, we see that we are not alone. There is there a, a heart that being inhabited, which spirituality teach us how it was inhabited, and it says, مَا وَسِعَتْنِي سَمَاءِ وَلَا أَرْضِي وَلَكِنْ وَسِعَنِي قَلْبَ عَبْدِيَ الْمُؤْمِنِ Neither my heavens nor my earth contained me, but the heart of the believer contained me. Means you begin to feel when that knowledge, that light of God begin to fill your heart, you begin to feel that you have to be manifest as God is manifesting on everyone His mercy, you have to be merciful with everyone. So spirituality teach us how to be merciful with each other. So we teach the way how to be feeling with each other. And how to feel with each other? We have to put you with people in a community that there are sick people. We send you to Africa, go to a village, sit with those people who need care, take care of them. This is how it works. So you begin to feel the, 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 the pain of people. You begin to feel the sadness of people. Then you begin to create yourself. You feel the contentment in yourself that you are doing something for the benefit of the humanity. So this kind of spirituality that begin to evolve in the self when you begin to take, to study Sufism and spirituality. And also to eliminate the bad characters from within us. And uh, I have put a book on Sufi science, and uh, I ha have shown that there are 17 different bad characteristics in a human being. And I give you an example of one or two, is love of grandeur, hubbul azama. People, uh, people, nature, is they love to be sitting on a chair, like me, speaking with people or someone else, not like the director, but uh, not the director. 
So our nature is, we love to be very high. So that is one of the bad characteristics. When you speak to people, you have to feel that they are the teacher and you are the student. Why they are the teacher and you are the student? Because if they are not sitting here and reflecting on you, what they need to hear, to whom you are going to speak? To the wall? So that's, that's feeling that I need you, you need me. If you were not there, I cannot speak. But because you are present, I can speak. So I cannot say I am a teacher and you are a student. I say I am a student, you are a teacher. With you I am able to speak. When Jesus came, he was speaking to, to the community. If that community was not there, to whom is going to speak? Moses the same, Muhammad the same. So these messengers, they came to a community. If this community was not there, what they are going to say to themselves? So that, that is the, the, the humbleness. Spirituality makes you to feel humble to everyone, to look at them with a nice feeling, with a good feeling, no ill feelings, no hate. And that one of the main characteristic and principle of Sufism is before you sleep at night, you have to forgive everyone. You have to say, oh my Lord, I'm forgiving everyone. I don't put in my heart any hate to anyone. If we want really to go in that journey, in that spiritual path, it's not easy. It takes time and it takes hard work. But at the end, you will feel content. And at the end, you become like a light shining for the others who are around you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have one question more. We will do a couple of questions, if it's possible. Thank you. I'm not hearing. Mr. Muhammad, uh, I think you have to ask that from the politicians, uh, not from me. 
If I have a piece of land, I give it to you. <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't have. Uh, but you, I want to tell you one thing that uh, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Sayyidina Muhammad, والسلام, when he came, he was teaching in Darul Arkham. I think you know that. In a small room, and only there were seven or eight people in, in a room. And he was teaching. So if it is a flat, it is a flat, there is baraka, blessings in it. If it is big mosque with, uh, with uh, I don't like to say it at the end of the lecture, but with Wahhabi money, we don't need it. Agradezco muy sinceramente las palabras y el su parlament porque realmente ha confirmado que nos encoraja a todos a que existan los caminos de diálogo y de entesa. Después, ahora, después de haber escuchado todo el su discurso y todas las respuestas a las preguntas, le voy a hacer una pregunta que la voy a todo el respeto y, digamos, para que se me entienda bien, dentro del lenguaje que podrían decir en lo sexo, que no se me entienda malamente, yo lo digo como prego. Pero, digamos, ¿cómo es que usted explica que el Islam ha conseguido vendre's tan malamente? Com és que ha tingut uns directors de màrqueting tan, tan, tan nefastos que ens han arribat a donar una imatge tan negativa d'aquesta magnífica reproducció? Thank you for this question. It was really in my heart to say it, but but I didn't t t touch it because I, I felt that it might be controversial, the answer. Why the, they didn't portray Islam or marketed Islam as, as, they, as it should be? First of all, in the old time, in the Ottoman time, there was what we call Shaykh al-Islam, the head of the Muslim figure, the highest. And always his seat was by the emperor. And whenever the emperor needed need an advice, he gave an advice. He doesn't give an advice according to the wishes or the politic strategy, political strategy of the king. He gives an advice, legal one, looking at truth and say it, regardless if the uh, king accepted or not. He is not a chameleon that color itself with different colors according to where it is. Today, unfortunately, in many different Muslim governments, the highest authority of Islam, sometimes they give verdict to satisfy the benefit of the rulers. That's why it's becoming a problem. They are not giving advice as Islam should be, and they are not giving the right advice. They are giving it the way that the politician benefit from it. And that's why you can find Previously, not now, might be two years ago, that there was the issue of suicide bombing. You recall that. Everyone was speaking about suicide bombing. Is it okay or not okay? It is Islamic uh, principle or not? It's allowed in Islam or not? I put a book on that that is not allowed. But two main scholars in different countries, and I'm not going to say their names or the countries. Two main scholars, the highest of the scholars, 
they came with a verdict that suicide bombing is not legal and it is prohibited. After one week, they changed their minds and they gave verdict that Islamic su uh, uh, suicide bombing is accepted Islamically. So you see here there is a conflict. <coughs> How you can give a verdict first day, first week, and you change it the next week? Verdict cannot be changed. When you give it, you means you are giving it because you are ahead of the religious uh, scholars. You know what you are speaking about. You don't make mistakes in such issues. So why one day is this, the other day is changed? So we see here that the Muslim people created for themselves the bad image of Islam. Islam is innocent from them. Islam is a religion, is a heavenly religion, like Christianity, like Judaism. It doesn't call for uh, 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 violence. Islam is a peaceful one. And that's why you have one billion and a half Muslim around the world. If we want to be more exact, one billion and two hundred thousand. Can you say that one billion and two hundred thousand are bad people? It's impossible. But the image that they gave, these scholars, that they take money for their verdicts and they are on the payroll of the government, that's where is creating the bad image of the Muslim, unfortunately. And thank you. Recollirem dues o tres preguntes que quedaven i farem una una sola resposta després, sí. Sí, salam aleikum. Hemos aprendido a través de de las estructuras de los que nos anteceden que el sofismo es la religión del amor y eso es muy bonito entre la la gente Aquí las vergas, por ejemplo, reúnen gente, como bien ha mencionado, cristianos, eh, musulmanes o otras religiones también. Eh, a veces he preguntado gente, por ejemplo, que bueno, me he encontrado con gente sufi.